Book three, chapter seven of British Goblins Welsh Folklore, Fairy Mythology, Legends and Traditions. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. British Goblins, Welsh Folklore, Fairy Mythology, Legends and Traditions by Wirt Sykes. Book three chapter seven part one with the growth of modern refinement the people of every land have become constantly more decorous in their grief the effort of the primitive and untutored mind to utter its sorrow in loud and wild lamentations and of friends and neighbours to divert the mind of the sufferer from his bereavement gave rise to many funeral customs of which we still find traces in wales pennant while travelling in north wales noted with regard to one thomas middleton a fact which he held to prove that the custom of the irish howe or scotch coronage was in use among us the welsh for we are told he was buried cum magno dolore et clamore cognatorum et propinquorum omnium no such custom now exists but there is a very impressive rite of a corresponding character but religious called the guilnos it is a meeting held in the room where the corpse is lying on the night before the funeral the irish cry why did you die is replaced by pious appeals to heaven in which great and strong emotion is expressed the deceased referred to in stirring sentences and his death made a theme for warnings on the brevity of earth life and the importance of the future life of the soul on the day of the funeral however the customs are not always in keeping with modern notions of the praiseworthy indulgence in beer drinking at funerals is still a welsh practice and its antiquity is indicated by a proverb cladu i mar akati cur to bury the dead and to the beer the collection of welsh writings called cymru fu refers to the custom thus to translate before the funeral procession started for the church the nearest friends and relatives would congregate around the corpse to wail and weep their loss while the rest of the company would be in an adjoining room drinking warm beer crow brewed and smoking their pipes and the women in still another room drinking tea together the writer here speaks of the custom in the past tense but apparently rather as a literary fashion than to indicate a fact at any rate the custom is not extinct occasionally it leads to appearances in the police court on the part of the injudicious mourners after taking the coffin out of the house and placing it on a bier near the door it was formerly customary for one of the relatives of the deceased to distribute bread and cheese to the poor taking care to hand it to each one over the coffin these poor people were usually those who had in expectation of this gift been busily engaged in gathering flowers and herbs with which to grace the coffin sometimes this doll was supplemented by the gift of a loaf of bread or a cheese with a piece of money placed inside it after that a cup of drink was presented and the receiver was required to drink a little of it immediately alluding to this subject the rev e l barnwell says although this custom is no longer in fashion yet it is to some extent represented by the practice especially in funerals of a higher class to hand to those who are invited to attend the funeral oblong sponge cakes sealed up in paper which each one puts in his or her pocket but the providing and distribution of these cakes are now often part of the undertaker's duty part two what connection there may be between these customs and the strange and striking rite of the sin-eater is a question worthy of careful consideration it has been the habit of writers with family ties in wales whether calling themselves welshmen or englishmen to associate these and like customs with the well-known character for hospitality which the cymry have for ages maintained thus malkin writes the hospitality of the country is not less remarkable on melancholy than on joyful occasions the invitations to a funeral are very general and extensive and the refreshments are not light and taken standing but substantial and prolonged any deficiency in the supply of ale 
would be as severely censured on this occasion as at a festival some have thought that the bread-eating and beer-drinking are survivals of the sin-eating custom described by aubrey and repeated from him by others but well-informed welshmen have denied that any such custom as that of the sin-eater ever existed in wales at any time or in the border shires and it must not be asserted that they are wrong unless we have convincing proof to support the assertion the existing evidence in support of the belief that there were once sin-eaters in wales i have carefully collated and excluding hearsay and second-hand accounts it is here produced the first reference to the sin-eater anywhere to be found is in the lansdowne manuscripts in the british museum in the handwriting of john aubrey the author it runs thus in the county of hereford was an old custom at funerals to hire poor people who were to take upon them the sins of the party deceased one of them he was a long lean ugly lamentable poor rascal i remember lived in a cottage on ross highway the manner was that when the corpse was brought out of the house and laid on the bier a loaf of bread was brought out and delivered to the sin-eater over the corpse as also a mazard bowl of maple full of beer which he was to drink up and sixpence in money in consideration whereof he took upon him ipso facto all the sins of the defunct and freed him or her from walking after they were dead aubrey adds and this custom though rarely used in our days yet by some people was observed in the strictest time of the presbyterian government as at dinder nolens volens the parson of the parish the kindred of a woman deceased there had this ceremony punctually performed according to her will and also the like was done at the city of hereford in those times where a woman kept many years before her death a mazard bowl for the sin-eater and the like in other places in this country as also in brecon for example at clangors where mr gwynne the minister about sixteen forty could not hinder the performance of this custom i believe says aubrey this custom was heretofore used all over wales he states further a d sixteen eighty six this custom is used to this day in north wales upon this bishop white kennet made this comment it seems a remainder of this custom which lately obtained at amersden in the county of oxford where at the burial of every corpse one cake and one flagon of ale just after the interment were brought to the minister in the church porch no other writer of aubrey's time either english or welsh appears to have made any reference to the sin-eater in wales and equal silence prevails throughout the writings of all previous centuries since aubrey many references to it have been made but never so far as i can discover by any writer in the welsh language a singular omission if there ever was such a custom for concerning every other superstitious practice commonly ascribed to wales the welsh have written freely in august eighteen fifty two the cambrian archaeological association held its sixth annual meeting at ludlow under the presidency of the hon r h clive m p at this meeting mr matthew moggridge of swansea made some observations on the custom of the sin-eater when he added details not contained in aubrey's account given above he said when a person died his friends sent for the sin-eater of the district who on his arrival placed a plate of salt on the breast of the defunct and upon the salt a piece of bread he then muttered an incantation over the bread which he finally ate thereby eating up all the sins of the deceased this done he received his fee of two shillings and sixpence and vanished as quickly as possible from the general gaze for as it was believed that he really appropriated to his own use and behoof the sins of all those over whom he performed the above ceremony he was utterly detested in the neighbourhood regarded as a mere pariah as one irredeemably lost the speaker then mentioned the parish of flandeby where the above practice was said to have prevailed to a recent period he spoke of the survival of the plate and salt custom near swansea and indeed generally within twenty years i e since eighteen thirty and added in a parish near chepstow it was usual to make the figure of a cross on the salt 
and cutting an apple or an orange into quarters to put one piece at each termination of the lines mr allen of pembrokeshire testified that the plate and salt were known in that county where also a lighted candle was stuck in the salt the popular notion was that it kept away the evil spirit mr e a freeman the historian asked if sin eater was the term used in the district where the custom prevailed and mr moggridge said it was such is the testimony i venture no opinion upon it further than may be conveyed in the remark that i cannot find any direct corroboration of it as regards the tin eater and i have searched diligently for it the subject has engaged my attention from the first moment i set foot on cambrian soil and i have not only seen no reference to it in welsh writings but i have never met any unlettered welshman who has ever heard of it all this proves nothing perhaps but it weighs something part three of superstitions regarding salt there are many in wales i have encountered the special custom of placing a plate of salt on the breast of the corpse in the case of an old woman from cardiganshire who was buried at cardiff and who was thus decked by her relatives i was told the purpose of the plate of salt was to prevent swelling there is an irish custom of placing a plate of snuff on the body of a corpse hence the saying addressed to an enemy i'll get a pinch off your belly yet the irish also employ the plate of salt in the same manner in view of the universal prevalence of superstitions regarding salt too much weight should not be placed on this detail in connection with the accounts of the sin eater such superstitions are of extreme antiquity and they still survive even among the most cultivated classes salt falling toward a person was of old considered a most unlucky omen the evil of which could only be averted by throwing a little of the fallen salt over the shoulder my own wife observes this heathen rite to this day and so i fancy do most men's wives jocularly no doubt but with a sort of feeling that if there is anything in it etc salt was the ancient symbol of friendship being deemed incorruptible in the isle of man no important business was ventured on without salt in the pocket marrying moving even the receiving of alms must be sanctified by an exchange of salt between the parties an influential legend is noted among the manx inhabitants of the dissolution of an enchanted palace on that island through the spilling of salt on the ground in da vinci's picture of the lord's supper judas iscariot is represented as overturning the salt an omen of the coming betrayal of christ by that personage in russia should a friend pass you the salt without smiling a quarrel will follow the scotch put salt in a cow's first milk after calving even the chinese throw salt into water from which a person has been rescued from drowning all these practices point either to lustration or propitiation part four it has been suggested that the custom of the sin eater is in imitation of the biblical scapegoat Quote, and aaron shall lay both his hands upon the head of the live goat and confess over him all the iniquities of the children of israel and all their transgressions in all their sins putting them upon the head of the goat and shall send him away by the hand of a fit man into the wilderness and the goat shall bear upon him all their iniquities unto a land not inhabited and he shall let go the goat in the wilderness End quote. this brings up the subject of charms and magic and is illustrated in wales if not by the sin eater by the cock and hen of st tegla's well this well is about halfway between wrexham and ruthin in the parish of Flandegla, and has been considered efficacious in curing epilepsy one of the common names of that complaint in welsh is cluif e tegla tegla's disease relief is obtained by bathing in the well and performing a superstitious ceremony in this manner the patient repairs to the well after sunset and washes himself in it then having made an offering by throwing into the water fourpence he walks round it three times and thrice recites the lord's prayer if of the male sex he offers a cock if a woman a hen the bird is carried in a basket first round the well then round the church and the rite of repeating the paternoster again performed 
after all this he enters the church creeps under the altar and making the bible his pillow and the communion cloth his coverlet remains there until the break of day in the morning having made a further offering of sixpence he leaves the cock or hen as the case may be and departs should the bird die it is supposed that the disease has been transferred to it and the man or woman consequently cured the custom is associated with the ancient druids as well as with the jews and its resemblance to the scapegoat is suggestive part five the funeral procession in rural districts where hearses are unknown wends its way graveward on foot with the corpse borne by the nearest relatives of the deceased a custom probably introduced in wales during their residence here by the romans the coffin of metellus the conqueror of macedon was borne by his four sons the coffins of roman citizens held in high esteem by the republic were borne by justices and senators while those of the enemies of the people were borne by slaves and hired servants as the welsh procession winds its way along the green lanes psalms and hymns are sung continually except on coming to crossroads here the bier is set down and all kneel and repeat the lord's prayer the origin of this custom as given by the welsh is to be found in the former practice of burying criminals at crossroads it was believed that the spirits of these criminals did not go far away from the place where their bodies lay and the repeating of the lord's prayer was supposed to destroy and do away with any evil influence those spirits might have on the soul of the dear departed the welsh retain much of the superstitious feeling regarding the graves of criminals and suicides there is indeed a strong prejudice against hanging on account of the troublesome spirits thus let loose the well-known leniency of a cardigan jury may be connected with this prejudice though it is usually associated with a patriotic feeling what would you have hung your own countrymen is the famous response of a cardigan juror who was asked why he and his brethren acquitted a murderer the tale may be only a legend the fact it illustrates is patent it is related that in a dispute between two cardigan farmers some fifty years ago one of them killed the other the jury believing the killing was unintentional acquitted the homicide but whether the man was guilty or not his neighbours and the people who lived in the district and who knew the spot where the farmer was killed threw a stone upon it whenever they passed probably to show their abhorrence of the deed that had been perpetrated in that place by this means a large heap of stones which was allowed to remain for many years arose they were then removed to repair the turnpike the custom is apparently jewish hangings are almost unknown in wales whether from the extra morality of the people or the prejudice above noted part six the legend of the grassless grave is a well-known montgomery shire tale concerning a certain spot of earth in the graveyard of montgomery castle upon which the verdure is less luxuriant than in other portions of the yard one dark november night many years ago a man named john newton who had been at welshpool fair set out for home soon after he was brought back to welshpool in the custody of two men who charged him with a highway robbery a crime then punishable with death he was tried and executed in spite of his protestations and in his last speech admitting he had committed a former crime but protesting he was innocent of this he said i have offered a prayer to heaven and believe it has been heard and accepted and in meek dependence on a merciful god whom i have offended but who through the atonement of his blessed son has i trust pardoned my offence i venture to assert that as i am innocent of the crime for which i suffer the grass for one generation at least will not cover my grave for thirty years thereafter the grave was grassless a bare spot in the shape of a coffin marked amidst the surrounding luxuriance the place where lay the penitent criminal unjustly executed then a sacrilegious hand planted the spot with turf but it withered as if blasted by lightning and the grave is still grassless certainly an unnecessary extension of the time set by the defunct for its testimony to his innocence part seven a curious surviving custom at welsh funerals 
is the offrum or parson's penny after having read the burial service in the church the parson stands behind a table while a psalm is being sung and to him go the mourners one and all and deposit a piece of money on the table the parson counts it states the amount and pockets it if the mourner depositing his offrum be wealthy he will give perhaps a guinea if a farmer or tradesman his gift will be a crown and if poor he will lay down his sixpence each one that intended making an offering of silver would go up to the altar in his turn and after each one had contributed there would be a respite after which those who gave copper as their offering went forward and did likewise but no coppers were offered at any respectable funeral these offerings often reached the sum of ten and even twenty pounds in the year thus the welsh work can read foos speaking as usual in the past tense but the custom is a present-day one the welsh believe that this custom was originally intended to compensate the clergyman for praying for the soul of the departed it has now ceased to mean anything more than a tribute of respect to the deceased or a token of esteem towards the officiating clergyman in the parish of Defynog, Breconshire, there was a custom up to eighteen forty three when it seems to have ceased through the angry action of a lawless widower of giving to the parish clerk the best pair of shoes and stockings left behind by the defunct a still more curious form of the offering which also survives in many rural neighbourhoods is called the arian i raw or spade money at the grave the grave digger rubs the soil off his spade extends it for donations and receives a piece of silver from each one in turn which he also pockets in merionethshire the money is received at the grave in a bowl instead of on the spade and the gift is simply called the offram i well recollect when a lad says an entertaining correspondent at Llanhydro in mocknant seeing the clerk or sexton cleaning his spade with the palm of his hand and blowing the remaining dust so that the instrument of his calling should be clean and presentable and then with due and clerk-like gravity presenting his polished spade first to the kinesophaid next of kin and then to the mourners one by one giving all an opportunity of showing their respect to the dead by giving the clerk the accustomed offering at times the old clerk ere heng locket when collecting the offering rather than go around the grave to the people to the no small annoyance of the friends would reach his spade over the grave at the particular time referred to the clerk having nearly had all the offering saw that facetious wag and practical joker mr b extending his offering towards him from the opposite side of the grave the clerk as was his wont extended the spade over the grave towards the offered gift the opportunity for fun was not to be lost and whilst placing his offering on the spade mr b pressed on one corner and the spade turned in the hands of the unwitting clerk emptying the whole offering into the grave to the no small surprise of the clerk who never forgot the lesson and the great amusement of the standers by it is noted in this connection that the sexton's spade was a terror to the superstitious for if the gravedigger would but shake his spade at any one it was a matter of but short time ere the sexton would be called upon to dig the grave of that person who had come under the evil influence of the spade has the sexton shook his spade at you was a question often put to a person in bad health part eight until a recent date burials without a coffin were common in some parts of wales old people in montgomeryshire not many years ago could remember such burials in what was called the cadas doipen or cloth with two heads old richard griffith of trefelglwys who died many years ago recollected a burial in this fashion there when the cloth gave way and was rent whereupon the clergyman prohibited any further burials in that churchyard without a coffin that was the last burial of the kind which took place in montgomeryshire in the middle ages there was a welsh custom of burying the dead in the garment of a monk as a protection against evil spirits this was popular among the wealthy and was a goodly source of priestly revenue part nine sul coffer is an old welsh custom of honouring the dead on the sunday following the funeral 
and for several succeeding Sundays until the violence of grief has abated. In the journal of Thomas Dinelli, Esquire, an Englishman who travelled through Wales and Ireland in the reign of Charles the Second, this passage occurs after description of the wake, the keening, etc. Quote, this done ye irish bury their dead and if it be in or near ye burying place of that family the servants and followers hug kiss howl and weep over the skulls that are there digged up and once a week for a quarter of a year after come two or three and pay more noise at the place End quote. the similarity in spirit between this and the welsh shawl coffer is as striking as a difference in practice the welsh walk quietly and gravely to the solemn mound beneath which rest the remains of the loved and there kneeling in silence for five or ten minutes pray or appear to pray the sole coffer of ivan the harper is a well-known anecdote ivan the harper was a noted character in his day who desired that his coffer should be thus i should like said he on his deathbed to have my coffer but not in the old style instead of the old custom asked williams of merlin and richard the harper to attend the church at flanfrog and give these my disciples my two harps and after the service is over let them walk to my grave let williams sit at the head and richard at the feet of my grave and let they play seven welsh airs beginning with daffidi garagwen david of the white stone and ending with toriad y dud the dawn the former is in a flat key like death and the latter is as sober as the day of judgment this request was religiously obeyed by the mourners on the ensuing soul coffer part ten reference has been made in the chapter on courtship and marriage to the welsh practice of planting graves with flowers there are graves in glamorganshire which have been kept blooming with flowers for nearly a century without interruption through the loving care of descendants of the departed by a most graceful custom which also prevailed until recently each mourner at a funeral carried in his hand a sprig of rosemary which he threw into the grave the pagan practice of throwing a sprig of cypress into the grave has been thought to symbolize the annihilation of the body as these sprigs would not grow if set in the earth whereas the rosemary was to signify the resurrection or upspringing of the body from the grave the existing custom of throwing flowers and immortelles into the grave is derived from the ancient practice but the welsh carry the association of graves and floral life to the most lavish extreme as has already been pointed out shakespeare has alluded to this in cumberleen the scene of which tragedy is principally in pembrokeshire at and about milford haven arrive with fairest flowers whilst summer lasts and i live here fidel I'll sweeten thy sad grave, thou shalt not lack the flower that like thy face, pale primrose, nor the azured harebell, like thy veins, no, nor the leaf of eglantine, whom not to slander outsweetened not thy breath. End of Book Three, Chapter Seven.